we're very excited to introduce Nazir Afsal, OBE, to King's Politics. Welcome. Welcome. Delighted to be here. <laughs> um, so Nazir Afsal came to the public eye after he was made Chief Crown Prosecutor for the Northwest of England, especially with the prosecution of the Rochdale grooming scandal. This, however, is just the tip of the iceberg, with his work on Rochdale helping change the landscape for child protection. Other areas of speciality include violence against women and girls, sexual abuse and honour-based killing, all of which are covered in his book, The Prosecutor. As a side note, I'd implore you all to read it. It was by far the best book I read last year and I have read it multiple times since. That's so kind. <laughs> he is now uh, the National Advisor on Gender-Based uh, Violence to the Welsh Government and sits on the National COVID Ethics um, Policing Committee. So welcome Nazir, we're very excited to have you here today. Lovely to be here, or there, or here, or there, <laughs> wherever I am. <laughs> <clears throat> so I thought I'd start at the start of your book, and at the start of your book, you begin with a racist attack that happened to you as a young man. Um, how much did this shape your desired career path? Entering the legal field, did you honestly believe in justice? Um, like everybody, we're all on a journey, aren't we? And I, my journey started in, um, in inner city Birmingham, in a two up, two down terrace house with eight of us living there. Me and, me and um, five siblings, um, all of us. I was born in Birmingham. Um, I was surrounded by a lot of love. I mean, I have to admit, my home was uh, a safe, loving environment. But the moment you walked out the door, uh, you knew uh, that because you were different, you would be treated very differently. I was born in the shadow of Birmingham City Football Ground. Um, you, you're too young to remember skinheads on the street. Um, literally, uh, there wouldn't be a time when I wouldn't come back covered in spit. Um, and it wasn't because of religion or race, it was just because you were different. And uh, the incident I relay in the book at the beginning was to demonstrate um, that I had, you know, my journey began as a victim. Um, you know, having been beaten black and blue um, by, by three men who used my head as a football, um, and then going home and having attended to by my father and my father saying, well, I, well, I was, you know, you know, saying I want to go and report this and tell the police. Um, and he was saying, well, what's the point? Nobody's going to listen to us. And um, you know, he uses the phrase, there's no justice or there was no justice. And those words were ringing in my ears for a long, long time. Um, why? Why is there a, sex, a segment of our society that's unheard, um, you know, not listened to and ignored? And that was the view of millions uh, in the in the seventies and the sixties, it was um, particularly those of us from migrant backgrounds. Uh, but even if you weren't from a migrant, if you're working class, if you were from um, traveller communities, whatever, you know, there were large sections of our society that were just being ignored. And I clearly that clearly had an impact on me. It's the point where you know um, I, you have the great good fortune of being able to do everything online. Back then, you know, I spent most of my life in a library and. Uh, you know, I, I was reading about these lawyers that achieve so much and uh, people like Mandela or um, Jinnah or um, Gandhi, you know, they were all lawyers who um, used their knowledge of their law and the critical, critical skills that they learned as a lawyer to deliver change. Law was just a tool. We, we spent far too much time, um, you know, focusing on section this and section that when actually you should be thinking about it in a sort of holistic way and um pretty much doing all my reading uh, and i realized that i wanted to be a lawyer but that was again those of us who were immigrants or children of immigrants we found that really difficult i remember having a conversation with my father about it and my mother for that matter and they were saying well why do you want to become a lawyer you know we at some point they're going to kick us out and when they kick you out back to Northern Pakistan, where my family come from. Um, we, we need scientists, we need engineers, we need doctors, we need mechanics, we don't need lawyers. Uh, you know, we've got plenty of lawyers. And so, you know, the, the, even at the back of their mind, there was a, a belief that we shouldn't be doing, our children shouldn't be learning something that would be of no practical use uh, if they were ever kicked out. And you remember, you know, history books will tell you in, in 74, the Ugandan nations were all 
kicked out of Uganda. And uh, for, for example, the Home Secretary's father was one, and mother were, were those people that were kicked out of Uganda. So the, it wasn't a, a veiled threat, it was a real threat or a real possibility that you would at some point um, be returning to or being taken to somewhere where uh, your family originally came from. So, but I persuaded my family that law was what I wanted to do. And, and then quickly established that actually um, I wanted to do something. I didn't want to do corporate law or company law or commercial law, even though they were, as you appreciate, better paid. Um, I wanted to do something that I thought would make a difference and change. And so I quickly moved into criminal law. Um, I qualified and, and um, worked in a defense firm and um, very quickly realized that wasn't me either. Um, you know, we will all need defense lawyers. Um, we all need people to stand up and represent us when we haven't got the skills ourselves. And, uh, but it wasn't me. And there's one particular incident that I relay in the book where, you know, I'm advising a rape suspect uh, in a police station. Today, if you are um, the victim of a rape, you give a video recorded interview and, and that is your evidence in chief, in effect. Uh, but this was in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, and there wasn't any video recording of interviews. It was all written statements. And I'm sitting with a, a suspect of a rape and I'm reading to him the statement of the, of the victim. And I saw, I, you know, I clearly see in my eyes that he was, he was getting off on it. He was actually reliving what he had done. And I thought, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to represent you, you piece of shit. Uh, and um, I made it very, very clear that wasn't the career that I wanted to pursue. Um, so I quit pretty much soon after and decided that I wanted to move into prosecution. And again, uh, I don't know if you want to ask me the question or do you want me to, I can go carry on talking if you want. I mean, I was going to say you have preempted at least three of my questions. Right. So far. Uh, well, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I, I, prosecution, again, until 1986, um, the police did their own prosecution. So they would employ their own barristers to do that. Uh, they'd have their own solicitor department to do that. Uh, but that was problematic. Uh, problematic was that uh, there was no independent scrutiny of a decision to prosecute. There was no independent scrutiny of, of decisions in terms of disclosure, for example. Uh, and so it led to a number of very high profile miscarriages of justice. Uh, the Birmingham Six, Guildford Four, and many others. Uh, in fact, I was, I was defending a group of uh, um, criminals. They were, they were criminals, no doubt, about, no doubt about it, but they were being set up, fit, fitted up by the West Midlands Serious Crime Squad, a whole police squad that were intended on um, their view of, of catching criminals was to manufacture evidence against them. And so I knew how corrupt it was. I knew how bad it was. And therefore, having an independent prosecution agency was an absolutely essential in a democratic country and so but we all, we've only had it for 35 years so it was created in 86 I joined it in 91 uh, and it was very much uh, in its um, infancy when I joined. I was going to ask when you joined the CPS it was at the very beginning compared to it now surely there was a lot more freedom. Oh yeah I, I, compared to anything what you know you, you, you all know well your your parents probably tell you this um we didn't have key performance indicators back then. Uh, nothing we did was measured. Now everything is measured. The KPI is left, right, and center. Uh, and so when I was, when I joined, there were two things to be said. One is we were detested beyond beyond hate. Uh, the defense community hated us because we'd taken their lawyers, many of their lawyers. Uh, the judges hated us because they didn't have their normal barristers standing in front of them, the one they could manipulate. Uh, the police hated us because they'd lost the power to um, prosecute their own cases. The public hated us because we weren't properly funded uh, at, the, at the outset. You know, the government didn't give enough funding. Uh, we were losing paperwork. We didn't have, this is pre-internet, we didn't have, uh, we were losing files, that kind of stuff. It was pretty chaotic. And so we were hated by everybody. But the plus side of that, Annabelle, is that I could do what I wanted and I could learn through my mistakes. So I could go to court. I could say I'm doing way beyond my pay grade. I could say, oh, here's a, here's a serial murder in Nazir. Would you handle this? Oh, okay. Uh, and um, so, you know, I prosecuted a, um, they called him the gay slayer. He murdered five uh, 
a gay men in, in central London in, in the early 90s. Uh, way beyond, I should, you know, as a two year qualified lawyer, I should never have come anywhere near that case. And today, today I wouldn't. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to do cases like that and to learn very quickly from very experienced barristers and experienced lawyers around me how to handle such cases. Uh, so think, when you yeah. joined the CPS, and it's quite clear that you seem to be quite drawn to murder and sexual abuse rather than something mm -hmm. like fraud, why is that? Um, well, I don't want to say this, but I will say fraud's really boring. Uh, you know, exhibit 2037B uh, doesn't really fill me with uh, uh, enormous amounts of joy. Uh, whereas, you know, um, seeing and hearing and reading about something that would, you know, has destroyed a life or may destroy other lives and, and people left behind, uh, that resonated with me. And, you know, you're all old enough, uh, so I can share a particular story with you. Um, you know, in the, in the mid 90s, I was um, first contact for the Metropolitan Police's paedophile unit. And, uh, and they were the national paedophile unit. So uh, this was before every, every force had its own unit. And I would go into Scotland Yard and I would be talking to these officers about cases way before anybody had been arrested uh, and advising them and guiding them, you know, again, way beyond what I should be able to do. And there was one particular case, um, I don't know, where parents had been sexually abusing their children. And um, in the days of camcorders, uh, so you know, early video recording, the, the, they had recorded, uh, the father had recorded him raping an 18 month old baby whilst uh, mother held the baby down. And so as part of the preparation for the case, I'm watching this and realizing um, that it's not a job I'm doing, that I'm on some kind of mission, you know, that I, you, know, you can't go home that evening and switch off, uh, you know, let's watch EastEnders and get on with our life. No, you, your life does change when you see people in such extreme circumstances. And uh, I have no doubt that's what attracted me to, to these areas of work where real harm was being done to real people. And I mean, your, spe your specialities are areas of law which are so sensitive. You have to be so incredibly empathetic. I presume this isn't something they teach in law school. No, no, they don't teach you that in law school. And it's, a day, it's, it's one of the things I'm, I'm always concerned about is that, um, um, that some people never learn it. Um, and that may be one of the reasons why they go into areas that just don't require so much empathy, you know, um, because they don't have it in them. Um, for me, maybe because of my upbringing, maybe because of the violence I referred to earlier where, you know, I felt what it felt like to be a victim. Uh, empathy was, was second nature. Um, but again, again, as I said a moment ago, Annabelle, when you see or read uh, or hear the horrors that people have to experience, I don't know how you cannot be empathetic. You know, as a human being, you must clearly be impacted by what you've seen or heard. I, I can't imagine you wouldn't be. Uh, and people behave in different ways. I mean, uh, lawyers have a tendency to drink too much. Uh, I know I know a lot of lawyers uh, who, whose uh, self-defense mechanism, I guess, was down the pub every night to recover from what they've seen or done. Um, I don't. I didn't do that. Uh, and others, maybe maybe they fall apart. But I think this is one of the benefits of working in an institution like the Crown Prosecution Service, as you're part of big teams. You know, uh, teams of lawyers, teams of paralegals. And you were all working with uh, one, um, you know, as one. Uh, and so you actually look out for each other uh, in a way that perhaps you're not able to do in, in many other professions. Um, and it sort of helps you get through uh, those, those testing days, uh, of which there will be many. But, you know, whilst you do see the worst of us, you also see the best of us. You see, um, you know, phenomenal officers. That, when I mentioned the Peter you know, earlier, I've always been struck by those people. They would get up in the morning, they'd go into work, and from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. they'd be observing um, indecent images of children, videos, etc. because everyone's a crime scene. You know, you try to identify the perpetrator, the victim, where the patterns are occurring, um, whether you can intervene, etc., etc. They'd finish and they'd go home to their children, and it wouldn't be the end of their day. They would get up the next morning and do it again, and then... 
next day. You know, um, that kind of relentless pursuit of justice um, really fills me with awe. And I learned a great deal from people who thought that way. And so I think it, in addition to having empathy, you've got to have a passion for wanting to make a difference. And you cannot make a difference unless you act differently. So in light of recent events, Sabine Inessa, Sarah Everard, I think it's apt that we talk about one of your specialisms, violence against women and girls. Um, compared to your early days in the CPS, how well do you think rape cases are being treated and prosecuted? Well, it was shambolic in the early days. I mean, rape was um, never taken seriously until around about 2000. Until, until, until in the 90s, domestic abuse, rape, sexual violence uh, was not, there were specialist teams, um, there were specialist prosecutors, um, the NGOs weren't properly funded. Um, it literally was, uh, um, you know, it worked sometimes. And then, then when I became chief prosecutor um, in 2001, one of the things that struck me was, can you hear my chihuahua, by the way? Should I kill her? <laughs> she always picks a live moment before she decides to attack the, uh, the doorbell. Anyway, um, I, I, stopped, well, I had a real opportunity. I mean, I was man I'm managing about 800 lawyers. Uh, just imagine what it's like to manage one lawyer, never mind to multiply that by 800. Uh, I am, uh, de but I'm also realizing that every prosecution is a failure because somebody has been harmed to get to me. So what can, what can we do about prevention? So I started reaching out to the communities, the public, and I started telling people, um, would you tell me what's going on? And so NGOs working in sexual violence, in honor-based abuse, in um, domestic abuse, started coming to me and telling me, right, there are real gaps in provision here and gaps in the support and gaps in the performance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so slowly but surely, um, I realized actually I have some influence, two bits of influence. Once, uh, one is that, uh, you know, as a government servant or crown servant, we're not government, we're independent of government, crown servant, I am sitting with the home office and, and all the government, you know, government departments and I can tell them stuff. Uh, and secondly, um, I have access to the media and that means that I can share our thinking, our views, et cetera, et cetera, progress issues uh, with the media in the hope of changing things. And so we began to turn things around um, slowly but surely, but um, you know, we made massive progress in the first half of the last decade. So around about 2010 to 2014, 15, every agency, we, I think got it, and they were properly resourced for the first time ever to getting it. And then, and this is not being party political, then things went downhill because of resources or lack of. You know, you often hear that figure, 21,000 fewer, fewer police officers. Um, what you don't, uh, don't get and don't think about is that the people that left, the police officers that left were the most experienced, 25 years or so each. So actually we lost half a million years of policing experience in a year or two. Uh, we lost 20, I had to reduce my budget and therefore my prosecutors by 25%. The courts, there are 800 fewer police stations now than there were um, 10 years ago. Uh, the number of courts has been reduced. So, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, look at your wallet or your purse, take away half the money and see if you can do what you can do with that. So. Well, whereas, and you know, the facts, the data speaks for itself. In 2015, we had the highest conviction rate for violence against women and girls in our history. And now we have a 1.8% conviction rate, pretty much the lowest it's been since record behind. And that's within five years. What else could be responsible um, when you have the loss of so much experience uh, and so lot of summer resources. So, you know, uh, we are in a pretty bad place. And um, and uh, Sarah's murder, Sarah Rod's murder, doesn't just reflect upon the fact that it's a police officer that did it. Between Sarah's murder and Sabina's murder, 78 other women died, you know? Uh, two women every week are killed in the 
um, in domestic abuse, uh, 10 women kill themselves every week, a figure less known. Uh, one in four women will have suffered domestic abuse in their lives. One in five will have suffered sexual assault. 97% of women told that survey earlier this year that they have suffered sexual harassment. I actually believe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that actually the other 3% just don't remember it. You know, um, it is that, that, you know, pan the pandemic that will outlive this pandemic is the pandemic of domestic abuse, sexual violence, and violence against women and girls. And are we applying uh, our learning from COVID to this? No. Do we have regular COBRA meetings? Do we national meetings? Do we have a, a national policing strategy that reflects that? Do we have um, daily press conferences? No, 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 no. So uh, I think we're not getting any better anytime soon. But, but that said, given we made such significant progress in a short period of time, um, six or seven years ago, we know what we need to do. Absolutely. Um, I think this is a nice time to talk about your work when you were Director of Prosecu Prosecutions in London in 2003, yeah. um, where you turned your attention to honour-based killings. And you have said that being a man, being a Muslim man, uh, was helpful when you were prosecuting these crimes. Yeah, I think um, being a man, maybe not so much. Um, I opened the doors to NGOs and the NGO, the largest NGOs working in forced marriage on the based abuse said, Nazir, look, women women are talking about it, but men aren't talking about this. Could you see what we can do about that? And one of, one of my, one of my um, personal traits was to organize national conferences. Uh, and I, I decided to have a national conference on honor based abuse and forced marriage in 2004. What I didn't know at the time, Annabelle, was actually it was the world's first conference on the subject, but anyway. Uh, and I invited all these parliamentarians and they said, oh, it's too difficult to come. So I organized it right opposite parliament. And I said, just pop in, you know? Uh, you make it as easy as possible. And you know, they did, many of them popped in. They listened to what they were hearing. I thought, oh my God, this is, this is happening in this country. Um, and I, like many things, I said, I wanted to walk away and leave it to other people. I'm responsible for 150,000 prosecutions a year. So I didn't, have, I didn't think I had the time. Uh, but nonetheless, the women's group said to me, firstly, no man's talking about this subject this year. And secondly, you have some influence that other people don't have. So they, let, they made me understand the subject. They made me appreciate what we were dealing with. And then it was left up to me then to get all the um, government departments around a table. We defined the terms. So when you look at the different definition of honor-based abuse, we, we were responsible for that. Uh, we pr introduced or uh, produced the first ever uh, national guidelines uh, for policing, prosecution, and other agencies. Uh, we uh, and we've got the first ever data. You can't do anything without data, by the way. Um, you know, you've got to present a business case. So I got the Metropolitan Police to literally fingertip go through every homicide in 2004 and, and determine how many of them were on a based abuse. And they came back with a figure of 12, um, which we'd never had before. Um, I then got my teams to start looking at our own casework to see whether we'd missed these cases. We prosecuted them as homicides, for example, but we hadn't appreciated what we were dealing with. Uh, and what the other thing I learned, Annabelle, was to persuade other people, you've got to tell stories. It's not enough to talk figures, you know, 12. You have to tell them what you're talking about. So, so I, when, I, when we went through our, our casework, I, I realized we've got some f staggering stories here. So Roxana Naz was murdered, she was 19, she was murdered by her mother whilst her brother, strangled by her mother whilst her brother held her down because she was pregnant by some other man. And when she was being tried, when the mother was being tried, the mother was asked, why did you kill your daughter? And she said, it was her kismet. It was her destiny. Wow, right. When Heshi Jonas was 16, she was murdered by her father because he found out that she had a boyfriend. He only found out that she had a boyfriend because the school rang him up and said, uh, your daughter wasn't in school yesterday. Was it anything to do with her boyfriend? I don't blame the school. The lack of awareness and recognition of the of the dangers you put people in uh, wasn't clear to everybody. But you know, I I then went round national educational welfare offices and the national union of teachers, national head teachers, and I scared the living dare out of them. Because do you want to be the person responsible for the death of a young child because of your um, inadequate training or, or inadequate guidelines? So 
slowly but surely we were turning things around. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, the names of the victims are etched on my brain, you know? And, uh, and again, people were saying, oh, this is because of ignorance and people are really poor, poor people do this. And then they said, how about Samara then? Samara was, lived in West London. She went to university at Kingston. She was setting up her own recruitment business. She was from a wealthy family who ran and owned lots of um, restaurants and cash and carries. Uh, but she fell in love with someone. Her mother took her to her boyfriend on an April morning and said to her, would you please wash your hands of her? Because I don't know what will happen if you don't. And her boyfriend said, I love her. Why would I want to wash my hands of her? Two hours later, Samara was stabbed 18 times in the presence of her infant nieces who were splattered with her blood. And that taught me something else, that you have to, if you're an agency, you have to work at pace. You can't say to a victim, come back tomorrow. Because in Samara's case, there was no tomorrow. And so unless you have uh, training and policies in place, that means anybody and everybody, so your university, uh, whoever's at the um, um, front office, Needs to, if somebody comes running in and saying, look, I'm, a, I'm going to be a victim of X, Y, and Z, they need to be able to signpost somebody for help then, not come back tomorrow. So, you know, we were picking up all, I was picking up all this learning from all of these cases and applying them. And then we need to change the law. But well, you're going to ask me about Bernard's case first, though, aren't you? Yes, I was going to mention Bernard's <laughs> Mahmoud. Um, Bernard Mahmoud, to give you context, was a young woman who was murdered by members of her family, her own family, um, because she fell in love with someone that they didn't approve of. It took many years to get successful prosecutions, but they were eventually reached. Successes like this must be so bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, Bernard's case, I mean, if you've, there's, actually, if you made a drama about it last year, starring Keely Hawes, um, I think it's still available on the hub, it's called Honor. And Bernard was 16 when she was forced to marry. She was beaten black and blue and raped by her husband. She managed to persuade her family to take her back at the age of 18, reluctantly. At the age of 19, she's seen kissing her first ever boyfriend outside of Morden Tube Station in South London by some busybody in the community who then goes to her father and uncle and says, how dare your daughter kiss somebody in public? Now, if somebody said that about my daughter, you know, I'd be He'd be the one that's dead. But anyhow, the point then was that they all decided that they had to have a meeting. They had a meeting with all these men and decided that Bernard's must die. She was then plucked off the streets of London. She was raped by one of her murderers. She was strangled. She was put in a suitcase and buried 100 miles up the road in Birmingham. Um, the family didn't report her missing. Why would they? Uh, and it took her boyfriend uh, courageously telling the police for the police to carry out the inquiry, which led ultimately to the conviction, not just of her father and uncle, two of her killers went off, went back to Iraq. Uh, this is post Saddam Hussein. And we got them extradited back. And, you know, we've never had until then an extradition from Iraq in 80 years of Iraqi history. But we persuaded the Iraqi government that this meant, it, this is really important to us. You know, we bring these men back to face justice and, the, and they allowed them to come back and we, we prosecuted them. So at the end of the day, five men in prison, for life for the murder of a 90 year old girl for kissing her boyfriend outside of a tube station. Then we needed to change everything, which literally, we changed, we produced the first ever national police guidelines. We changed the law, you know, we, there's a new, there's a, the Forced Marriage Civil Protection Act 2008 came into being uh, because we persuaded the government, Blair's government, that the, the law needed to change to offer more protection. Um, I went round, you know, if you know that when you go and watch a band, you have a t-shirt with all the all the places the band visited. My t-shirt in 2008 would be the Royal College of GPs, the Royal College of Medicine, the Royal College of Nurses, the Coroner's Society, every local authority in the country, literally telling everybody they need to change. And they did change, to their credit, they changed. So we Bernard is deaf. Her legacy, the legacy is uh, we made thousands of women safer. And the Forced Marriage of Protection Act created something called protection orders. And we've, been ha we've had more than 3,000 protection orders issued in the 12 years since the law came into being. So we've saved 3,000 lives as a result of that bit of legislation. So absolutely it's worth it. Uh, and it comes, it comes at a personal cost. I mean, there's no secret. I'm on an Al-Qaeda death list and have been now for 13 years, 14 years. Yeah. Um, Maybe they didn't like me. I don't know whether they'd like me or not. It doesn't really matter. I'm still here and Al-Qaeda aren't, so there you go. 
Um, but I think they have, you have to recognize that you can change, a lawyer can change if you change everything and people's worlds, if you work with allies. And my allies have always been the women's groups and the NGOs. You know, I'm, I'm a patient of nine of them. Uh, yeah, they are doing the work at the frontline grassroots. And all I'm able to do is to make sure they're properly funded and it's properly supported. But that's how you, that's how you bring the change. Um, I was going to ask, um, do you think honor-based killing has an expiry date? To me, honor-based killing isn't about faith. It's purely male power. And as we as society become more equal, do you think honor-based killing is going to die with it? Do you know, honor-based killing, domestic abuse, sexual violence, all of that is about male power. Uh, let's be honest. You know, I prosecuted, I don't know, 10,000 rapes during my career. And not one of them was about sex. They were all about power and control. So, uh, you know, I'd love to be optimistic, Annabelle, and say to you um, that um, we're going to, that, that's it, on a base as an expiry date. Uh, we've ma made massive strides. We've reduced the number of killings in this country by half in the last decade, but there's still half as many as there were 10 years ago. And we also know that people are exported for murder. So, you know, they're told, um, right, there's a wedding taking place in India. E2, lovely, go to this wedding. And guess what? They, they never turn, return. You know, so um, we still have our issues. This requires an international response and not just a national response. But at its core is power and control. And power and control is not something that uh, I have the power or you have the power to remedy. You know, it goes back, anybody of faith, uh, you're right, absolutely right to say it's got nothing to do with faith. It hasn't. Uh, I prosecuted um, a Catholic family. Um, uh, I prosecuted Eastern European families for honor-based abuse. Um, you know, it's got nothing to do with faith. It's got everything to do with control. It's got everything to do with this. You know, if it was really about honor, by the way, Annabelle, why is it only the women carry the honor of the family? You yeah? know, um, I remember talking to this father um, a few years back. Uh, he said to me, uh, Nazir, you don't understand. My, my son's in jail for crack dealing in crack cocaine. And my, uh, my daughter, she um, uh, wants to marry someone of her own choice. And what shame she's bringing to my family. And I was thinking, hang on, what about, you just, what about the son you just mentioned? You know? uh, uh, so why is it that the daughter is the only person that carries the honor and burden of the family? That is going to take longer. Uh, and um, it's my criticism of the current approach to violence against women generally is the focus on women's safety. You know, uh, the government's immediate response to, response to Sarah Everard's murder was uh, more street lighting. You know, that only just shines a light on the inadequacy of the response. You know, you'll see who's going to kill you. Great. Uh, let's, let's actually change the narrative here. Uh, it's not about women's safety. It's about male violence. And male violence when I, whenever I talk to men about this, I tell them uh, 90 percent, more than 90 percent of violence against women is carried out by men. But more than 90 percent of violence against men is carried out by men. More than 90 percent of violence against children is carried out by men. So we can be we should be allies here in dealing with violent men and responding to uh, what it is that makes men violent. Uh, that is what will give us the expiry date. I don't know. Um, so now I'm going to move on to your time in Manchester. In 2011, you were appointed the Chief Crown Prosecutor for the North West of England. At this time, you were made aware that gangs made up of mainly Pakistani men were grooming vulnerable and underage girls in the area of Rochdale. In 2009, the CPS had made the, de the decision to not press charges. What made you go against the decision of your predecessors? Because it was wrong. <laughs> to put it bluntly, uh, we, used, we used to use, until 2011, 2012, until this case, we, we used to use the Wensbury Unreasonable Test. Have you all learned about Wensbury Unreasonableness? Um, basically, it's so unreasonable that no reasonable person, literally, this is lawyers for you, by the way, uh, we, 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 we find a, a way of saying wrong without saying we were wrong. Um, but actually, the answer was simple. Um, I said that was wrong. Uh, this, this girl, again, if you watch the BBC film Three Girls, by the way, um, uh, that's this case. And the actor who played me is much more handsome than I am, but I'll take that. But the, you know, in this scenario, the girl, the, the view of prosecutors and police officers was that 
this girl would never be believed, believed by a jury. Yeah, I have, yeah, I'm sitting there watching her video interviews, and I believe her. So the only reason we're saying that is because we, it's too difficult, or it's difficult. We have, but the important thing was to say, firstly, we got it wrong. So, right, we're going to reverse the decision not to prosecute. Second thing is we tell the jury, we got it wrong. The jury should not be blaming her for our failures. And so we did that. And that was, suddenly the door was open and we were able to prosecute those men. Um, but we did so in the eye of a storm. In the far right, we're outside of court every day. Um, uh, the victims themselves, had never trusted an adult in their life, so why should they bother trusting us? So we had to build bridges um, uh, and communicate with them uh, properly and make sure they're properly supported. Bespoke, in a bespoke way, I didn't have any guidelines as to how to do this. One of the girls, for example, um, she'd only go to court every morning um, if um, the officer went round to her house and put on a Disney film for her and made her a bacon buddy. And, um, you know, that, there's no guidelines that tell you to do that, but we realize she needs to trust us. We need to help her. And so um, the girl, you know, and the, tr the whole system was flawed then. You know, those victims were giving evidence and being cross-examined for days on end. Uh, that can't happen anymore, by the way. And that's another product of Rochdale, is that we persuade the judiciary that shouldn't happen anymore. Multiple d defendants should not be cross-examining um, one victim or one complainant over and over again. So now you have something called ground rules hearings, which you may have heard about. A judge at the beginning of a trial looks at the evidence and says, right, uh, nine barristers are here defending. One of you can ask her questions on behalf of all nine. And I've read the evidence and the, uh, you will have two and a half hours to ask the questions. But prior to Rochdale, six days, a 17-year-old girl is being examined and cross-examined about the most intimate things that could happen to you for six days. So we needed to change the whole system. Um, but the, uh, the amazing moment, 5th of May, 7th of May, 2012, when those men were convicted, um, what I hadn't prepared for, Adabel, was um, the media and the public interest. You know, um, suddenly on the back of one case, I'm now the world's expert on sexual abuse of children, you know, uh, because everybody wants me to write an article in The Guardian or The Times, or everybody wants me to do an interview, or everybody wants to, me to do talks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of them want me to focus on the ethnicity of the perpetrators, uh, who were British, Pakistani, British, Asian. Uh, and the girls that they knew about at the time were British white. They were actually British Asian girl victims too, but um, we did a separate trial for them. Um, but, you know, so, but the ethnicity of the men was an issue. It was not the issue. The issue was, going back to what I said right at the outset, that a large group of our society is unheard, not listened to. These girls have been left behind um, and allowed to, to suffer, uh, and we needed to listen to them. And that's my message to everybody. Uh, that was a message that came out of this case. Um, and there was a personal cost. I mentioned the Al-Qaeda earlier on. Let me talk about the other side. Um, suddenly, uh, the far right realized that I damaged their narrative. Their narrative is that every brown or black is the same. So they wanted to suggest that that was their narrative. And then when they discovered, hang on a minute, Nazir Afsar prosecuted these guys. Uh oh, he's brown. Um, right, so they created uh, the first example of fake news I've ever come across. They put stuff on Facebook saying that I was the one that didn't prosecute these guys. Uh, and of course, you know, every, I'm being lauded in Parliament, I'm being carried on the streets, uh, but for some reason their followers believe that, that rubbish. And I've prosecuted the most horrible people you can possibly imagine, but they never came to my home. Suddenly I had a, a far-right thugs demonstrating outside of my house. I had to have a police officer outside of my front door for two weeks. I had to tell my kids who were teenagers that the Prime Minister's got a police officer outside his door to make them feel better. They could only go to school for three months in a taxi because that was the safety advice I was given. I got um, 17,000 emails sent to my teams in a few days calling for me to be sacked and deported. You know, I was born in Birmingham. I don't want to go back there, right? And then, then I had, I don't know, everything being thrown at me. And if it wasn't for the people around me, the, the people I work with, my family, and the people who kept me safe, it would have drowned me. And yet I was the one that got every decision right. You know, I think people need to realize how real racism is. I have no doubt whatsoever that if I was white chief prosecutor, they wouldn't have been coming for me. Um, uh, but as it happens, um, that's what happened. But then it was necessary to do something more than the case. Uh, nobody else should have to suffer what those girls had to suffer. So I was working with my then uh, 
uh, boss colleague, Keir Starmer. What, what happened to him? I don't know. Uh, and um, we we created a national panel, uh, which meant that every chief constable or chief constable, prosecutor had to refer cases that they think they got wrong in the past. We started re-instituting all these proceedings. We produced national guidelines for tackling child abuse. Um, we supported um, the significant prosecutions of high profile figures. So um, people you may know, Max Clifford, Rolf Harris, uh, people like that. Uh, and, uh, and people you wouldn't know, you know, teachers, doctors, you name it. Um, and so we really made, it goes back to my point earlier on, between 2012, I left the Crown Prosecution Service in 2016, 15. In that three year period, we went from being rubbish to having the highest conviction rates in our history. It, and see, we can do it. We know what needs to be done. And we needed, and it needed, uh, it needed leadership, it needed um, commitment, it needed specialisms, it needed proper resourcing, but we can do it. So you started, we started the interview talking about how you wanted to do, to make change, and you've most certainly done that. In the legal sphere, where do you have your sights set now? Uh, to cause as much new, much, um, I'm, a, I'm a right nuisance to put it bluntly, and um, and I have no problem with that. You know, I've got 100,000 followers on Twitter, 400 other MPs. They they can hear me when I want to talk to them. I've written, I write regularly for the national newspapers. I've written today for the Daily Mail, for example, on um, um, on an in judicial inquiry in relation to misogyny. Um, I uh, I have very, I'm very very privileged uh, that you know my book's done well. It's, it's, be, it's being turned, it's in paperback now, so it's cheaper. It's being uh, turned into a movie. Um, and um, the actor will play me is even more handsome. So uh, happy with that. Uh, and you'll see that end of next year, uh, all being well. Uh, and uh, I'm writing book two. And book two is about uh, uh, senior leaders from minority communities and the racism they've experienced. And so this morning I was talking to the chief exec of, of uh, PFA, the Professional Football Association, for example. So I'm getting the voices of victims who are leaders because people seem to assume that because you're a leader that you won't have suffered uh, i want people to know that they have uh you mentioned um my work as national advisor for the world government uh on that current continues i'm now would you believe it i'm now the independent chair of safeguarding for the catholic church uh so i'm holding the catholic church to account uh, I'm a member of the Independent Press Standards Organization, so I hold national newspapers to account. Uh, and uh, I will continue to find opportunities in which I can bring a change, uh, wherever it may be. Uh, I've done international work. I've been doing international rule of law work in, in Somalia, in Pakistan, in Ukraine, uh, and hopefully there'll be more opportunities like that. Um, but literally, you know, um, I wake up thinking, what chaos can I cause today? Um, and, but in that uh, long list you've just given me, politics not on the agenda? Never. Uh, you know, Keir asked, Keir's asked me, I, I've, I mean, politicians have asked me lots of times. Uh, you probably don't know Groucho Marx, it's too, way beyond, but as a comedian from the uh, 30s and 40s, he said that he would never join a club that would have him. And, you know, I know a lot of politicians, I spent all of Wednesday last week with several of them, um, between you and I. We have the worst lot of parliamentarians in my lifetime. Uh, you know, the level of intellectual knowledge is second to zero. You know, um, it, would I would I would I want to be part of that lot? Not in a million years, Annabelle. What I want to do is to hold them to account. What I want to do is to guide them and advise them, and they do ring me up for advice and whatever it is. And I'll keep on keep on on that front, but I don't want to be one of them. So change doesn't happen from within then? No, it can do, but change happens one step at a time and one person at a time. Let me, let me tell you about, Stuart Hall was a BBC presenter and he prosecuted 12, um, he was convicted of sexual abuse of 11 women and girls um, back th about three decades, over three decades. But he was found not guilty of, of the abuse of one, a woman now in her thirties. And I said to her, I'm really sorry that I couldn't give you closure. And she looked me in the eyes and said, Nazir, you gave me closure the moment you believed me. My recovery began the moment you believed me. So you can be a revolution and change by just changing one life. Uh, so don't think that you have to change the world. And on that note, my last question to you before I open up to everyone else is there's a wonderful comment on leadership in the afterword of your book. 
you comment that we have, <laughs> <laughs> we have a prime minister who boasts that everyone will vote the way that he wants to and that this is the antithesis of the culture that you have tried to build in your yeah. career. Yeah. How, how would you describe your own leadership versus those who are running? Um, well, inclusive. Uh, I don't know. I keep saying, telling people, I don't have the answers. What I do is have access to the people who do. The people who know most, for example, about crime are the victims of crime. You know, listen to them. They'll tell you where the mistakes were made uh, in terms of their journey. And so, I, you know, I'm privileged that people have shared their stories with me. That, I think, more than anything else, is what has driven me and made me the, the person I am. Um, but you mentioned earlier on empathy, you know, and sensitivity. Your, school, your law school will not teach you that. Your, your graduate degree will not teach you that. That's something that you have to build in yourself. And I can assure you that you spend an afternoon with an NGO that works in this field or any field to do with vulnerable people and you will get it. And, you know, um, something I said earlier on, that you can't make a difference unless you do different things. You know, don't be the sheep following in what everybody else has told you you should do. You know, find a, something that you are committed to doing and I can assure you, you'll make a massive difference along the way. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now very happy to open the chat to anyone else that wants to ask any questions. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, no question. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. Adija. Um, I was just wondering, um, so like, I don't know how to phrase this without sounding strange, but um, as someone who's also from like a South Asian community, which is like heavily tied into a very like intense misogynistic and patriarchal culture, have you faced any backlash from like your own community for what you do? Um, I keep telling you, I keep telling people when people say that, um, that 99.99% of our community are law-abiding, upstanding individuals. And they don't want these people um, in their midst anyway. So yeah. uh, far from, far from, um, yeah, yeah, yes, of course there are people who are, um, I remember being approached, I was walking through a, a town, I won't mention it, and not far from where you are actually. And uh, somebody comes up to me and says, it's you, isn't it? <laughs> right, uh, and then uh, decides to uh, have a have a five second, ten second rant uh, about about it, and it's water for ducks back, you know. But he he will be the exception. And uh, Hadija, our strength comes from being having loads of allies, you know. Uh, when we're all together, then they are the minority, and uh, I think that's all, you know we should all remember that that um, you know. Um, you can't do this alone, but be 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 assured that most people think like a sense of what most people understand human rights. Most people understand um, equality and, and all the issues that um, uh, should be mainstream, but perhaps aren't. Um, I think Ava would like to ask a question. Please. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Ava, and I just wanted to ask a bit about the recent events that we've seen over the past year and how maybe you think the law can be changed. So mm -hmm. I know that there's been lots of calls to make public sexual harassment a crime, maybe make misogyny a hate crime, and after what happened with Plymouth, maybe making misogyny a form of terrorism, especially with all those statistics that we, we covered earlier when so many women and marginalised genders are suffering from that. Um, and also kind of on from that, um, obviously in your career, you've had to cope with seeing such horrible things every day. And I know that myself as a woman and lots of other people that I know I, over the past year have just found it so overwhelming. So just kind of a, what can we do or how not to be overwhelmed so much by everything and keep kind of hope and faith? I mean, you will do and you will have. Um... You'll, 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 we know we're on, if you're on the right path, nobody's going to shake you from that either. So, uh, you know, you know, you're doing the right thing, you're saying the right thing. All the things you said, I'm in favor of, and I've, I've thought it through. And, um, uh, you know, public harassment, 
the, the, the obstacle to that, according to the Prime Minister, although he's never said it publicly, is how do you define harassment? One wink or two, he said to me, right? And I said, uh, you're stupid, aren't you? I mean, but it, the, the, you know, it's about, surely it should be about how the impact on you, the person receiving it. So, you know, a word that I might say to somebody else might be meaningless, but a word to you, you know, because you're wearing a blue top, uh, blue might be offensive to you. You know, so the way to respond to that when somebody say how you define it, it should be based on the impact on the person receiving the information. So yes, sexual harassment should be a, should be a crime. Misogyny should be, whether it should be a hate crime or not, it doesn't matter. At the very least right now, it should be recorded. It's not recorded by police forces around the country. So they have no idea uh, what they're dealing with. So at the very least, it should be recorded. In time, I think we should go down the route of, of it becoming a hate crime. And thirdly, um, misogyny as a national policing priority of victim violence is 100%. Uh, we did that with child sexual abuse has only been a national policing priority since 2013. Why do you think that is? Because we persuaded the government that that's why people will take it seriously. So uh, if you want to deal with violence against women and girls and take it seriously and not allow people to um, you know, decide whether it's a resource or not, make it a national policing priority. I, I, between you and I, again, uh, you know, I advise the Women's, Women's Equality Party, and that's their policy too. So, um, you know, I'm in favor of all of those things. And in terms of you and your personal resilience, uh, know that you're not alone. I'll tell you, I got an email last week. Um, I mentioned this to a whole case earlier on. I got an email from a, a, a victim. She said, dear Mr. Dear, dear Mr. Rapsell, she said, you won't remember me. Um, but I am uh, one of the victims of Stuart Hall. Um, and I'm, I'm now suffering, I, I now have terminal cancer and I will be dead in a few weeks. And I wanted to tell you that the last 10 years since my trial have been the happiest years of my life. You know, I haven't been, I don't I haven't worked out how to respond to her. I don't know what to say to her. All I know is that that's the impact you can have, you know, um, in changing someone's life and you know that keeps you going to know that you have changed somebody's life so profoundly so deeply um of course that motivates you and keeps you motivated um but don't don't not be angry you know be angry uh, uh but turn your anger into a positive into a positive force um, I think we've got time for one more question. Tom, did you want to ask a question? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, my, my question's about the role of the, the police in all of this. So you talked earlier on about the effects of um, the reduced funding the, the police received, particularly sort of post-2008. Recently, the police have come under a lot of heavy criticism and some have taken the, the next thing to follow from that is that the police needs to be defunded and resources put into, into other areas. Um, so I'm really interested to hear what your take is on, on that kind of argument and what the police need to do to, to yeah. improve how these crimes are, are addressed. OK, well, fine. I mean, as I said, I've written in the mail today about there has to be, I think this is their Stephen Lawrence moment. Um, there needs to be a judicial inquiry. I think the inquiry they've called for, which is doesn't involve witnesses, doesn't involve compelling summonses, etc. You know, you can't force people to, the inquiry they've got right now is in judicial, so you can't force people to give evidence. I think they need a... Uh, to restore public confidence that is judicial inquiry into misogyny and bigotry within the force. That I think it will give people confidence. I think police in general, I mean, people are well-meaning, extraordinarily well-meaning. They may not be well-trained uh, because 20,000 new officers coming out of police academy will not replace half a million years of experience. You know, so people need to realize they will take time to change. Um, and we need to help them do that. Uh, I think that, um, uh, Defunding the police, they're so badly funded, Tom. You know, uh, no, how, let's help them. We, what we should be doing is funding the things that matter. You know, I don't value people on uh, the wealth they have, the house they have, the car they have. I value them on the difference they make to others. And we sh that's exactly what we should be saying. Um, the proper community policing, neighborhood policing, we know that makes a difference. Uh, and we should be providing, providing all sorts of support for that to happen. But at the same time, we should be supporting uh, community initiatives, NGOs that work in the community, uh, victim support groups, all of those things. Uh, and then I think we'll make a difference. But it shouldn't be one against the other. 
I think that's thank it, Annabelle. You. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us in King's Politics today. It's been wonderful. You're welcome. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I wish you well. I hope your studies go extraordinarily well from now on.